Greetings, gentlemen. This story deserves that on its motives, Quentin Tarantino filmed his next masterpiece. A terrific story about adultery, about love, about deceit and about paying for your actions. So, let's hear it. I despise the regular gatherings at the county club, which seemed to happen every few weeks. It seemed that these events were just an excuse for many wealthy people to treat themselves to frivolous parties and amuse their egos. Unlike me, my wife Sandra enjoyed attending these gatherings and looked forward to them. But over the past year, her excessive drinking has become a problem, periodically leading to awkward situations for both of us. Sandra and I have been married for 24 years. We had three children who are currently in college. Our relationship began while I was getting my MBA degree, and we immediately found a common language. But about 10 years ago, our bond began to weaken, and I decided that this was a natural development. Although I longed for more affection and intimacy, I did not dare to express my desires. I reluctantly accepted the idea that the remaining years of my life would be devoid of romance. Fortunately, I had a successful job that brought in substantial income. Despite the significant financial burden associated with the education of our three children in college, we remained financially secure. Sandra, unlike me, had the luxury of not working and didn't want to do it. Instead, she devoted her time to community service and social events. It was my income that supported her lifestyle. Despite her age, Sandra managed to maintain her appearance, which I think was the result of numerous visits to spas and beauty salons. On the other hand, I considered myself a fairly average person, with a slight bulge in the abdomen and a scattering of gray hair at the temples. Dressing well was necessary because of my job and my wife's addiction to shopping. Although I was doing a great job, it didn't bring me real happiness. I longed for something new, a profession that would bring me joy without worrying about the salary. Besides, I wanted to change my place of residence. Our current house was too big for the two of us, and I despised the expense and time required to maintain it. But my wife categorically refused to discuss such ridiculous ideas. She was determined to keep her big house, her country club membership, and her rich circle of friends. During one of these meetings, I found myself wandering aimlessly around the club, constantly engaging in trivial conversations. The evening dragged on, and I quietly sipped my last drink for what seemed like an hour. And Sandra seemed more and more animated. It was obvious that she had drunk a little more than usual, and it was starting to take its toll. A group of local ladies known for their gossip gathered together, getting carried away discussing a rather taboo topic intimacy. Sensing the inappropriate nature of the conversation, I quickly decided to dodge and head in the opposite direction. As I turned to leave the room, my wife's voice suddenly became louder than usual. Honestly, if it wasn't for Todd Mitchell, I wouldn't have experienced a single pleasant moment in bed in my entire life, she exclaimed. There was a sudden silence in the room as some of the women noticed my presence nearby. Noticing the lack of laughter, Sandra turned her gaze to me. It was obvious that the excess alcohol had clouded her mind. Robert, I didn't know you were here. You shouldn't have eavesdropped on this, my dear, she apologized, admitting her mistake. Trying to defuse the situation, she let out a series of drunken giggles, reminiscent of a young girl's giggle. The surrounding people didn't seem to know how to react. Some quietly left the scene. Others were silent. Their conversations were suddenly interrupted. Sandra was looking at me with a mischievous grin, as if she had just staged some stupid prank. In response, I put my glass on the next table and quietly left the room in the club. Instead of going home, I drove to the airport and half an hour later boarded a commuter flight to Reno. Unlike Las Vegas, Reno seemed to me a much more preferable destination. Being there helped me clarify my relationship with Sandra and understand what had previously eluded me. I decided that the weekend spent in Reno would help clarify some aspects even more. Having decided to embark on this introspective journey, I turned off my mobile phone. It turned out to be easy to arrange accommodation in one of the large hotels. 
After opening an account for $20,000, I soon received a toll-free number. What attracted me to these casino accounts was their exemption from federal regulations, which makes them independent of mandatory reporting to the government. Although significant winnings in slots or kino games had to be reported, any deposits made to the account remained untraceable. Although I had no interest in gambling, I appreciated their unique banking system. When I woke up, it was already noon on Saturday. As I sat over a hamburger and fries, I reflected on my current situation. I liked Reno because of the pleasant climate due to the altitude above sea level. In addition, the abundance of gaming facilities meant that there were many convenient services nearby. Curiosity led me to walk along the Truckee River, where they paid homage to a broken marriage. Although I wasn't going to get divorced in Reno, the idea of symbolically letting go of myself by putting the ring in the riverbed intrigued me. Returning to the casino hotel, I noticed a real estate office decorated with numerous photographs in the window. I began to realize how attractive it is to have an apartment in Reno. It took a while, I spent an hour in the office and two more hours traveling, but eventually I came across a cozy, fully furnished apartment that immediately caught my attention. But there was one serious obstacle in my way. My current marital status did not allow me to acquire it. Fortunately, I was able to conclude an inconspicuous lease agreement with a subsequent purchase, offering a significant deposit as my own brilliant offer, much to the seller's delight. It was one of the smartest decisions I made at the very beginning of my marriage to take full control of our family's finances. Sandra, unfortunately, did not have the knowledge in the field of numbers and banking that I had. I was more than willing to pay the bills as long as she enjoyed spending the money. That evening, I decided to treat myself to a delicious sushi dinner. After that, before going to bed, I deposited another $10,000 for my Visa card into the casino fund. Although I despised the cash withdrawal fee, I thought it was worth it in this particular situation. The next morning, I woke up early and went to the casino restaurant for breakfast. A hearty meal of eggs, bacon, hash browns, and toast came in handy. Sipping my second cup of coffee, I noticed that the waitress serving me had a noticeable black eye. Despite the fact that she tried to hide it by combing her hair forward, her efforts were in vain. She looked like a pleasant woman in her forties. I watched her carefully as she moved from table to table, doing everything possible to make everyone happy. It seemed like a new experience for her, because she tried too hard. An experienced waitress would be more collected and confident but I admired her commitment to succeed at work. I noticed that her badge says Donna. Is that really your name? No, my real name is Dora, but they mistakenly called me Donna. Well, Dora, I'll have another cup of coffee. And if you tell me a story about your black eye, I promise to leave a generous tip. How about I fill your cup and you leave a smaller tip and you won't bring up this issue anymore? That sounds fair. I'm sorry for the curiosity. Since I already had the key to the condo, I decided to pack some necessary things to make myself feel at home. The first thing I did was look into the Silver Spur used car store, located on the next street. I chose the Focus sedan, which has seen better days, with mileage that I would not like to disclose. Although it was not ideal for long trips, it was quite suitable for running errands. I was thinking about renting a car, but considering my frequent returns, it seemed more practical to purchase one. For several hundred dollars, I managed to purchase everything I needed for a comfortable life, including several clothing options. The rest of the day was devoted to opening accounts at various casinos. Using a simple method, I wrote checks in the name of the relevant institutions, which immediately transferred funds to my account. The operations left no trace, no paper trail. By the end of the day, I had successfully transferred $60,000 to the account of four different casinos. To keep track of my losses over the weekend, I got a small spiral notebook that easily fit in my pocket. It recorded the amounts, dates, and names of the casinos in chronological order. Naturally, I didn't place any bets, but who would dare to doubt it? My reputation as a terrible poker player worked in my favor, making any losses at roulette craps or blackjack quite plausible. 
I had six months to raise enough funds for the down payment on the apartment. This shouldn't be a problem. I had completely forgotten that I had dined earlier, so I was completely hungry for dinner. The most convenient option was the same place where I had breakfast. Fortunately, fate decreed that Dora turned out to be my waitress for this evening. Why are you still here? It looks like you've had a long day, I asked. She replied, I have to work two shifts to make ends meet. I didn't expect such high rents in this area. Feeling that it was better not to get into trouble, I politely declined her offer of a drink. I made an order and tried to behave myself for the rest of the time. When I finished my meal, she brought the check and paused for a moment. I apologize for my abruptness today. Adapting to the new environment has not been easy for me, and I am a little shy of my eye. It was a parting gift from my husband when I informed him of my decision to come here for a divorce. Although this is not the first time, I hope it will be the last. By the way, thanks for the generous tips at breakfast. It means a lot. She smiled as she left, but there was a hint of sadness in her expression. Her smile stayed in my thoughts all night. As a result, I realized that there is not much I can do at the moment. Before I started work, I had to go home and sort out a few things. Fortunately, it was not difficult to arrange a flight to return, but I didn't know what to do when I got home. By a happy coincidence, Dora was supposed to work the next morning, and I managed to get a table in her section. When she brought the check after the meal, I asked for a minute. I have a little problem, and I would like to know if you could help me. I have to leave today and won't be back for a week. I need someone to look after the apartment. It's a two-bedroom apartment. Could you help me for a few months? I assure you there will be no conflicts. Are you serious? No obligations. I don't want to leave the apartment unattended, but most of the time it will be just you. And when I'm here, I won't bother you, I promise. To be honest, I wouldn't even mind if someone broke into the house and took everything. There's not much to lose anyway, but I didn't want Dora to know about it. All right. Is the diner within walking distance? It's very close. And also, I'll leave you my car. Just make sure there's always gasoline in it in case I come back. I will warn you in advance. There is a device on the phone where you can leave me a message. Dora just stood there and looked at me. I think she was afraid it might be some kind of trap. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to convince her otherwise. Here are the keys to the apartment and the car. The car is parked at the condominium. It's a dark blue Ford Focus. Here is the address of the condominium. If you don't feel comfortable, please don't go. I'll pick up the keys when I get back next Friday. I wrote down the address on a napkin and handed it to her. After accepting the napkin and the keys, she just stared at me. Dora, don't worry. Whether you decide to go or not, everything will be fine, I reassured her. An hour later, I was on my way home, although it would have been better to stay in Reno. After picking up my car from the long-term parking lot, I drove past the house and saw that Sandra's car was no longer there. Based on this, I decided to pack a few things to last until the end of the week. After packing my suitcase, I put toilet articles, clothes, a change of shoes, and my laptop in it. It took me no more than 10 minutes to do everything about everything. Besides, I didn't forget to bring my passport and birth certificate. Fortunately, my position in the company allowed me to access some kitchen units on consignment. So, I booked one of them for the next two weeks. After charging the laptop battery, I dialed my eldest son Jason's number. I informed him about the domestic problems I had encountered with his mother and explained that I would be busy for a while. Then I asked him to take the message to his sisters and assure them that there was no need to worry. All three of them went to Auburn, and I was lucky to get a discount for everyone. Although I still had to pay for out-of-state tuition, I was still grateful that I could afford it. After the conversation ended, I put the phone on charge and headed to the shower. The only food during the flight was a miserable bag of peanuts, so I was looking forward to a hearty dinner. Monday turned out to be hectic, as I decided to visit the bank to apply for a second mortgage on my house. Alas, this decision led to the fact that I ended up owing more for the house than its real value. 
But by the end of the month, the situation will change. After receiving information from the bank, I contacted Auburn directly and successfully negotiated an advance payment for my children's education. The school received a payment of $200,000 and $400,000, and I still had a cash receipt for a little over $200,000, which I had to bring to Reno. In order to receive additional funds, I cashed out two bank accounts, despite the associated penalties, and closed my money market account. At the same time, I decided to refrain from using credit cards until the end of the month. I arrived late at work, and found my reliable secretary eagerly awaiting my arrival, armed with black coffee and a cheerful grin. Good morning, Mr. Terrell, she greeted me. Can you tell me about what happened at the county club on Friday or do I have to believe the rumors? Emily, the rumors are really true. Is there anything else you need to know? Without hesitation, she replied, How can I help? Please gather as much information as possible about Todd Mitchell. I believe he used to work here, but I'm not sure. In addition, make sure that the tasks assigned to me are performed by someone from the staff, without revealing the reasons. All my scheduled meetings and meetings must also be rescheduled. Any more questions? As she left the office, Emily smiled at me encouragingly and gave me a thumbs up. At first, I assumed that it would take weeks to settle my affairs, but now I realized that all this can be done in a week. I immediately called my lawyer and made an immediate appointment. As I left, I informed Emily that I would not take or answer calls from my wife. I also instructed the guards not to enter the building. Jerry Proctor, my college friend and I got along well, but he never approved of Sandra. I thought he would be the perfect person to handle my divorce. Since I was at the country club on Friday, Robert, I think I understand why you came here. I think your intuition was absolutely correct. I don't want to sound disrespectful, but it's high time to do it. You were right again. I thought I could tolerate the situation as long as I wasn't publicly shamed. But on Friday, everything changed. I need access to all your accounts and some power of attorney. My assistant will prepare all the necessary documents, and I will contact you accordingly. Is there anything specific that I should know about? I'm worried that the traumatic events that happened on Friday triggered something in me. Unfortunately, I developed a gambling addiction, and I lost a significant amount of money over the weekend in Reno. I'm afraid that my upcoming trip to Reno next weekend will only make the situation worse. It's very sad, my friend. Have you kept a record of all your losses? Jerry asked, smiling broadly. Yes, I have documented everything and I can send you copies if you think it will be useful, I replied. Actually, I do not know that it is possible not to think about it. Do you agree? I said, realizing that it would be unproductive to dwell on this topic. You're right. Maybe you need something else? Jerry asked. No, it's okay. Go and mind your own business. And please take this financial sheet with you. Fill it out and bring it when you come to sign these forms tomorrow. I appreciate your support, my friend. At that moment, I realized that I had missed lunch. Emily has prepared a document with information about Todd Mitchell, which she recommended that I review before taking any further action. She also advised to seek advice from Will McGrim and the Human Resources Department. Vilma was a long-term employee of the company, enjoyed authority, and performed her duties accurately. Her unwavering professionalism was evidenced by her business suits and tightly tied hair in a bun. The confidence she exuded slightly scared everyone who got in her way. So, when Emily insisted on meeting with me, it became clear that she was of great importance. When I entered her office, Wilma greeted me politely, trying to create a sense of comfort. But her efforts were in vain, because I still felt a certain awkwardness. Being in her presence was akin to being in the company of a strict nun as a student. Despite the fact that I was an experienced and respected professional myself, I couldn't help but be awed by her domineering presence. Wilma closed the door to her office, marking the beginning of our conversation. Emily informed me about the current situation. Although I refrain from office gossip, I commit to dealing with factual information. 
Todd Mitchell confided in me three years ago, and I promised to keep our conversation confidential. Unfortunately, it seems that I can no longer fulfill this promise. If any of what I have said offends you, please do not hesitate to leave, and our conversation will end there. If you do not agree with what you are hearing, please direct your dissatisfaction elsewhere, as I am simply stating the facts. Do you understand, Mr. Terrell? Yes, I understand. I think I can take whatever you tell me without getting upset. I tried to add a touch of humor, but she only frowned slightly in response. About three and a half years ago, your wife Sandra approached Todd Mitchell during one of the corporate events. Alcohol flowed freely that evening, and during the evening Todd and Sandra engaged in intimacy in one of the private offices. It's worth noting that Todd was going to get married next month. Sandra threatened to reveal their affair to Todd's fiance if he didn't continue having sexual relations with her. Todd hoped that when he tied the knot, she would leave him alone, but she continued to force him to have sexual intercourse for several months, threatening to expose him. In a state of desperation, he turned to me for help and was forced to share the whole story with me. But I couldn't in good conscience disclose this information to you or anyone else. The most acceptable solution I could come up with was to move Todd to another office. As soon as he moved to Dallas, Sandra stopped her harassment. Todd decided not to report this problem to his wife. Do you have any questions? It seems that Mr. Mitchell was as much a victim in this situation as I was. At first, I thought about trying to get revenge, but now I realize that it would be stupid. Miss Grimm, since you have the knowledge, then the power is in your hands. I think it would be better to leave this matter in the past. Todd Mitchell is a valuable employee and asset of the company. It would be unfair to punish him for what your wife did. Thank you for your time and I agree with your previous suggestion. The fact that he was forced to have an intimate relationship with my wife is punishment enough. When we stood up, Wilma smiled. By the way, it's not Miss. I've been married for 32 years. The thought of Wilma being naked in bed with another man was hard to comprehend. Perhaps in some alternate version of herself, she turns into a seductive creature. But I was quickly distracted from my thoughts, realizing that there were more pressing matters than Wilma's romantic escapades. Emily rescheduled all my cases, giving me the opportunity to start over with a clean slate. Despite my wife's persistent calls, she refused to believe that I was in Baltimore, as Emily informed her. Emily set up meetings for me the next day one with the president of the company and the other with the legal department in the afternoon. Feeling a little brave, I invited Emily to have dinner with me, but she playfully declined, citing her husband's disapproval. She jokingly suggested that I invite Wilma instead. But my work in the legal department took longer than expected as a result of which I detained several people until the end of their working day. I apologized for the inconvenience, but they were understanding. It turned out that buying out my retirement plan for cash turned out to be more difficult than originally thought. Closing my 401k and shared savings account went smoothly, although it took a long time. Cashing out sick leave, vacation pay, and company insurance turned out to be easier than other tasks. It became clear that I was breaking up with the company. I hoped that this news would not reach my wife before I had the opportunity to discuss it with her. After completing the remaining tasks, I had dinner alone. Strangely, while eating, I was thinking about Dora. I wondered if she had moved into the apartment and was still working those long double shifts. Despite our limited acquaintance, I felt impatient about returning to Reno. I wanted to take a quick look at her and immediately pushed the thought away. It was childish to dwell on unrealistic fantasies. The next day I decided to cash out my two life insurance policies and cancel two urgent policies. The monetary value of life insurance policies surprised me. I planned to pick up the checks the next morning. Although my car was insured by the company, I canceled the insurance for Sandra's Lexus, which was issued in my name despite the fact that the lease agreement was signed in her name. Before I went to work, I stopped by Jerry's office to take the financial form and signed some papers that his secretary had prepared. 
When I returned to the office, Emily had already prepared a cup of coffee for me. Boss, I don't want to add insult to injury, but you should talk to Calvin Bostick from the settlement department before meeting Richard. Richard Ryder, the president of the company, probably already knew what I wanted to discuss. The settlement department was located in the basement, to be precise. I don't understand why everyone else ended up with windows and sunlight, and they were stuck in a dungeon. Emily mentioned that Calvin Bostick, a quiet and diligent man, would like to talk to me. Calvin took me to a secluded place, expressing concern about the aggravation of the situation in our office. Although I don't usually indulge in gossip and rumors, I felt it necessary to share something with you. About six years ago, a colleague named Raymond Upright worked in our team. He was an ordinary guy, married with two children. Unfortunately, after one of the office parties, he became infatuated with your wife. She persistently contacted him both at home and at work. Despite the fact that he realized his mistake and wanted to end the affair, she refused to let him go. She threatened to reveal their relationship to his wife if he tried to break it off. Unfortunately, he took her bluff seriously. Within two days, Raymond's wife kicked him out of the house, which led him on a path of heavy drinking and eventual job loss. I don't know his current location. In addition, Raymond's wife threatened to tell you about your wife's infidelity. As far as I understand, your wife paid her $10,000 for silence. I cannot provide any evidence to support the latter claim. Thanks, Cal. I'm wondering if anyone else has any positive news for me. Mr. Terrell, I'm sorry if my words upset you, but Emily advised me to let you know. You made the right decision, and I am grateful to you for that. I went to the ninth floor using the elevator. I arrived at the meeting with Mr. Ryder a little earlier than the scheduled time, but he quickly accepted me. The meeting was short and to the point. The legal department, HR department, and payroll department will solve all the necessary tasks on my behalf. He handed me a business card with his personal phone number, without making any commitments. While some issues were resolved, others remained uncertain. I thanked him with a simple nod, and left, without saying a word. Back at the office, Emily greeted me with a joyful expression on her face and offered me the usual cup of coffee. She motioned with her head that I should look out the window. Sandra was having a heated argument with a security guard in the parking lot. It's been more than 20 minutes, and she wasn't going to leave, even though she was refused entry. She came to me and asked me what I was going to do with these. The guards seemed to have the situation under control, and all I had to do was find someone to have dinner with. The idea of dining alone did not appeal to me. Trying to gather more information, I called Jerry and asked how things were going. But he informed me that he would not be able to help until I sorted out my financial problems. To explain the lack of funds, I had to demonstrate to him that I was completely broke. I had a lot of money. Taking into account the checks I received, those that were on the way, and the cash in my bank account, I was considered a wealthy person. I promised myself that I would go to Reno early and not come back until I had spent all my money. But I was constantly interrupted by people who stuck their heads in the door of my office and informed me that my wife wanted me to call her. She even went so far as to ask her friends to call their husbands at work to find me. Despite this, I stayed in the office for a few more hours to get myself in order and make it easier for my replacement. Sandra was patiently waiting for me on the hood of my car. Emily smiled at me and handed me the keys to her Honda Civic, using this as an excuse for her husband to pick her up and take her to dinner. Before I left, she asked if I was going to do something stupid while I was in Dallas. I assured her that I just needed to tie up some loose ends and promised that there would be no acts of revenge. I drove to Allentown, enjoyed dinner at the Outback restaurant and returned to my apartment before midnight. The next morning passed quickly. I signed some more paperwork for Jerry, closed all my bank accounts, and canceled all my credit cards. I have arranged for all utilities to be turned off in the house next week. I collected checks from the bank, the insurance company, and from my place of work, and was surprised to find that I had a significant amount of money. As a result, 
I bought a new mobile phone, and gave up the one that Sandra and I were using at the moment. Besides, I sold my membership in the county club to an old friend of mine for $23,000. Fortunately my shift at work was already in place when I visited him last time, and he turned out to be a nice person. He received 24 hours notice and came from Boston, knowing full well that this move would be beneficial for him. Fortunately, Emily had a deeper knowledge of office management than I did, which saved me from having to train my replacement. Despite the fact that I left a few things in the house, they were not so significant that I could go back and pick them up. Emily kindly offered me to leave her car, and her husband would pick her up from the airport. In preparation for the move, I bought a couple of inexpensive suitcases to pack my things in the apartment. Everything I forgot could be easily bought in Reno. It suddenly dawned on me that I had completed all the necessary tasks. All my assets were now in the form of cash. There were no stocks or accounts. Apart from the house, I had nothing else to offer, as it was intended for my wife. Fortunately, Air Blue turned out to be exceptionally kind, and they found several empty seats for an earlier flight, which they were happy to arrange for me. I dialed Jerry's number at his residence to inform him of my departure. Hi, buddy, I just wanted to warn you I'm leaving tonight. I suppose you have everything you need. Jerry assured me by saying, It's okay, Rob. I can hand over the papers tomorrow, but I need financial information as soon as possible. I assured Jerry, I'll start sending you evidence of financial irresponsibility as soon as I can. Just be careful, Jerry. I don't want any of us to have any problems. Expressing my concern, I added, I am sure that Sandra will find a well-known lawyer to help her, perhaps from Philadelphia, and he will most likely work full-time, perhaps quit it as soon as things start to decline. I emphasized the importance of Jerry's role by stating, Everything is in your hands, Jerry. Do everything you can for me. Just be careful not to inflate the bill too much. Soon I will become a man of modest means. Don't forget about it. Concluding the conversation, I reminded Jerry, and one more thing, try to find a man named Raymond Upright. It is possible that he may need help, and if so, then I can help. Got it, Robbie. Have a nice flight and stay in touch. I left a message on the condo's answering machine informing them of my late arrival. I wanted to make sure she wouldn't be alarmed if she heard someone outside the door. I wasn't sure if she would be there or not, but I didn't give up hope. It was strange that I didn't even know this woman, but at the same time I wanted to have some kind of relationship with her. At the moment, just a friendly relationship would be enough. Given her vulnerable position, I didn't want it to seem like I was taking advantage of it. I arrived in Dallas with enough time to enjoy a pleasant breakfast. I was waiting in Todd Mitchell's office when he came in. It was clear from his expression that he wasn't happy to see me. Mr. Terrell, I'd like to say I'm glad to see you, but that would be a lie. We both know that. Relax, Todd. I hope you don't mind my informal position. I'm not going to criticize or confront you. I just wanted to express that I sympathize with the situation you found yourself in some time ago, and I don't hold a grudge against you. I know that this could have been discussed over the phone, but it seemed to me that it was important enough to contact you personally. I don't understand why you need this. It's my fault, and I owe you an apology for what happened. You didn't do anything wrong. I was young, stupid, and made a terrible mistake. Even now I can't admit this to my wife because of the overwhelming shame. Todd, I have to admit that you played a role in what happened, but I believe that most of the blame lies with my wife. Her actions have led to complications not only for you, but also for me. I am not absolving you of responsibility, but it is important to recognize that the blame lies not only on your shoulders. I don't want you to feel unnecessary guilt because my wife's behavior was reprehensible. Your kind words are very valuable and I do not know how to express my gratitude and repay your generosity. I handed him one of Jerry's cards. I asked him to call my lawyer later today, as there is a possibility that he will need his help. I assured him that everything the lawyer asked for would remain a secret. 
Most likely he will only ask for a notarized statement confirming the fact of treason. I promised him that his wife wouldn't find out about it. We stood up and shook hands, although it was strange, considering that he was one of those who slept with my wife. But I thought it was the right thing to do. Todd Mitchell was a decent man who didn't deserve to have his life ruined because of one mistake, even if it was repeated. An hour later I was flying back to Reno and wondering where I had gone wrong. I have made great efforts to provide my wife and children with everything they need. I thought I had done a decent job. But it seemed that by taking care of everyone, I neglected my wife. When faced with similar situations, we all try to understand their causes. As a rule, I take responsibility for situations that go wrong. Although I can accept it, now I am faced with the fact that Sandra is deliberately trying to humiliate me. This is something that I cannot tolerate or justify. If she had been tactful, I could have ignored the situation and blamed myself endlessly. But her lack of discretion freed me from all guilt. The evening ended on a positive note when I arrived at Reno International Airport, Tahoe, and found Dora patiently waiting for me in the baggage claim area, which pleasantly surprised me. She was wearing jeans and a light blue Oxford shirt, which was different from her usual uniform. When I called, I didn't expect her to come and pick me up. I just wanted to let her know I was coming. Good evening, Dora. I didn't expect to see you here, I greeted her. I thought that since I have your car, it's the least I can do. Oh, you're not working? I asked, surprised. No, I was able to shorten the time thanks to your generous offer, she replied. I quickly clarified. Oh, I wasn't generous. I was just trying to find a way for us to be alone. Curious, she asked. And what are you going to do with me when you're alone? I haven't thought that far ahead yet. Any suggestions? I teased. As I was picking up my bags from the turntable, I noticed a slight blush on Dora's cheeks. Feeling that I might be overloading her, I decided to slow down before I scared her off. Her question looked like a playful invitation, and it gave me hope. Thirty minutes later, we arrived at the newly decorated apartment. The small touches that we added did not require a lot of money, but noticeably changed the overall atmosphere. In gratitude for the fact that she renovated the apartment and provided transportation from the airport, I treated her to two delicious prime rib dinners. Dora seemed to find more pleasure in the wine than in the beef itself. As for the progress in the divorce case, it turned out to be very disappointing. I still have three weeks left before I can apply, as it takes six weeks to obtain a residence permit. Given what everyone told me, I expected this process to be easy. Looking back, I think it would have been better for me to do this from the comfort of my home. Why didn't you choose this option? Dora paused for a moment, engaged in empty manipulations with food, but then looked up at me. Running away from Tony was more important than getting a divorce. The divorce itself was just a formality, unable to protect me from further bullying. Now I realize that I seized on the idea of divorce only as an excuse to run away. The destination was unimportant. The main thing was to leave. Dora's words resonated with me, and I began to doubt the importance of divorcing Sandra. All I really wanted was to prevent her from profiting from our marriage. But if I wasn't going to get married again, it didn't matter. My thoughts were not inclined in that direction. The rest of the evening was spent in casual conversations on mundane topics, hobbies, movies, and books. Dora had no children, and I refrained from asking about the reasons. That night we went to our bedrooms. When I woke up, Dora had already left for work. Fresh coffee was waiting for me, which satisfied all my needs. I was still feeling jaded after the previous night. After taking a quick shower, I focused on the task at hand. Jerry, my trusted lawyer, how are you doing? I asked on the phone. There was a sigh from the other end. Not a damn thing, Robert. I have some unpleasant news for you, but I hope you won't be offended by me. Unfortunately, while I was away for only one day, the situation changed for the worse. Sandra made a lot of noise by discovering your bank accounts and other personal files. As a result, 
She sued and obtained a restraining order against you, prohibiting you from approaching her, the house, or taking any things from it. Surprisingly, these accounts have already been emptied, but they are still frozen. In addition, despite the fact that your children are already of age, you are forbidden to contact them. Most of the things in the house are of little value, but resolving this situation will require significant time and money. Sandra went to extreme measures by involving the Securities and Exchange Commission in relation to your 401k retirement accounts, and she even managed to somehow involve the IRS. Rob, I have to be honest with you, I don't want to take any part in this. I am completely detached from this situation. Do you understand? I must admit I was stunned by this news. So, if I understand correctly, you will not represent me in the divorce proceedings? That's right, my friend. For your information, Sandra has also hired a private investigator to locate you. I can't help but wonder how she plans to handle the financial burden of all this. To be honest, I do not know, and I do not care. Just remember, if the police or federal agents inquire about your whereabouts, I will have no choice but to disclose this information. I will not risk my career for the sake of our friendship. I understand, Jerry. Take care of your protection. I will make some adjustments on my part. I won't be calling you for a while. Thanks for understanding, buddy. I was hoping you'd understand. Take care of yourself. Well, that certainly complicates the situation. Even the most thoughtful plans can collapse in an instant. Now I have to resort to plan B, but there is none. My brilliant idea to cheat on losing all the money in the casino was quickly stopped. I decided not to contact anyone else. Fortunately, Dora left me the car, for which I am very grateful to her. I can't imagine how she manages to get to work. And here I am with a small bag full of cash and checks. I had to visit six different casinos to cash these checks and exchange them for chips or credits. I was afraid to go to the banks, fearing that something might be delayed or tracked there. Fortunately, the casinos were willing to help me. All my funds were placed in different places, and I carried a bag filled with both cash and chips. After a quick lunch, I started withdrawing funds. In two hours, I turned all the chips into cash and withdrew all the money from my casino accounts. Now I had a significant amount of money. So far, there have been no problems or suspicions. It took me less than an hour to drive to Carson City, where I rented a large safe deposit box at one of the little-known banks and securely saved all but $5,000, which I left for immediate use. I felt a sense of relief knowing that everything was safe now. I couldn't wait to celebrate with Dora over a long dinner. But as soon as I entered the apartment, I felt that something was wrong. Dora was frantically trying to fix something that shouldn't have been broken at all. She looked up at me, immediately covering part of her face. I'm really sorry, Robert, she said. It's my fault. I do not know how he found me, and I did not realize that he was following me until I reached the apartment. I deeply regret that I did not show more caution. I sincerely apologize. Carefully, I took her hand away from her face. Dora showed a fresh black eye and a swollen lip. The right side of his face was covered with a large bluish bruise. Was that Tony? She confirmed my suspicions with a nod. He was supported by two brothers. They're looking for you now. Tony gave me clear instructions not to leave the apartment. Where are they looking? I told them the names of the three casinos. But these fools don't even know what you look like. It looks like their minds have gone haywire. It became clear that we had no other choice. We couldn't stay there. We couldn't involve the police. We dropped everything and headed west. We spent the night in a modest motel located in a secluded grassy valley. Despite the fact that we only had one bed, I behaved like a gentleman. I brought takeout and bought cosmetics for Dora. She tried her best to hide the bruises, but they were still visible. Throughout the night, she was constantly apologizing to me. I was relieved when she finally fell asleep. The next day, we went to Sacramento. I bought clothes and personal items, not knowing when we would be able to return to the condo. After booking two more nights at the Grass Valley Motel, Dora and I spent the next few days getting to know each other. 
Our communication was devoid of any intimate subtext or hints. Surprisingly, in just three days I felt more at ease with her than with my wife, with whom I had lived for 24 years. During my conversations with Dora, my thoughts were constantly occupied with various disturbing events. I hesitated to take her back to the apartment, fearing that Tony might discover her presence. In turn, I was afraid to return to the condominium myself, fearing that someone might be looking for me. But I carelessly left my laptop, passport and other personal documents, foolishly believing that they were important to me and therefore needed to be returned. Despite the fact that we had known Dora for a very short time, I decided to trust her. We were both in similar situations with our spouses. Have you ever been to Mexico? I asked her. No, she replied. Do you think we should go to Mexico? I'm not sure, I admitted. But let's consider this as a backup plan in case things go wrong. I have a request for you, but I want to ensure your safety and keep you away from Tony. Robert, you shouldn't feel obligated to help me. You've done more than enough already. I'll manage on my own. I have to admit that I'm not sure what lies ahead. I managed to stash a significant amount of money, but it was not acquired by criminal means. I'm just hiding them from my wife. If something happens to me, I can ask you to return the money on my behalf. Could you clarify who is hunting you? You didn't provide any details? Did you do something illegal? To be honest, several federal agencies are actively looking for me. She has hired a private investigator, and if necessary, the local police will be involved in the case. My only intention is to hide some of the money from my wife, who is trying to falsely accuse me of illegal activities. As for what to do with the money, I was considering going to Guadalajara and waiting for me there. You can use all the money you need to feed yourself until I arrive. Concerned about how you will find me, I suggest going to the Libertad market every morning to drink coffee. Despite its size, I'm sure I can find you. So, when should all this be done? If you've already realized that I'm in trouble, why don't we act immediately? But I'm asking you to be patient. I'd like you to accompany me, not walk alone. I'll feel safer if we go together. Why don't we both leave now? The conversation began to repeat itself, and I decided to ignore her. I didn't mean to be rude, but I couldn't wait to continue on my way. Two hours later we crossed the pass and arrived at Carson City. Dora's name was entered in the safe access list, and she received her key. When we got back to the apartment, I decided to park the car about halfway down the street. The residential complex had a convenient underground parking located under the apartments. Although it faced the street, it was well lit. Before getting out of the car, I told Dora to stay inside until I was sure everything was safe. I could not pinpoint the problem I had foreseen, as recent events have proven that at any moment everything can go wrong. Walking through the parking lot and carefully examining it for any signs of trouble, I suddenly heard my name. He called out to me, his small stature and wiry build. The long leather coat draped over him gave him a strange rather than menacing appearance. He just didn't have the aura to look convincing. But the big black machine gun, tightly clutched in his hand, inspired genuine fear. With curiosity tinged with caution, I couldn't resist asking, Do we know each other? His face instantly lit up with a wide smile. A sense of pride emanated from him. I'm Laszlo. Your wife sent me. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of this unexpected encounter. Okay, what do you need? I asked, trying to keep my composure. His request took me by surprise. I need your wedding ring and wallet, he said quite seriously. The idea of giving away an engagement ring seemed quite understandable to me, but the inclusion of my wallet in it puzzled me. Why the wallet? I asked. His answer sent a chill down my spine. I have to give the impression that it was a robbery. Confusion clouded my thoughts as I tried to comprehend the seriousness of his words. Make it look like a robbery? I stuttered. Mr. Terrell, I regret to inform you that your wife has used my services to end your life. I really hope that she has made an advance payment, as she currently has no financial means. 
the man replied in disbelief. What do you mean? The conversation ended abruptly when three intimidating Italians dressed in long leather coats came out of a distant parking lot. Bobby Terrell, we need to talk to you, Tony growled, displaying an assertive demeanor. Caught off guard by such an intrusion, Laszlo quickly turned to face the trio. At the same time, one of them noticed the weapon clutched in Laszlo's hand. Reacting quickly, all three attackers instinctively reached for their concealed weapons, and I hurriedly threw my body over the concrete barrier to take cover. As I headed for the car, Laszlo's attention shifted to me. The sound of gunfire echoed through the parking lot as I hurriedly moved along the side of the building. Looking up, I saw Dora streaking down the street, and two men in suits got out of a black SUV on the other side of the road. It was clear that these men in suits were federal agents, and I could only assume that they were hunting me. Fortunately, the intense firefight distracted their attention, giving me a brief opportunity to escape. Both Dora and the car disappeared without a trace. I categorically refused to return to this apartment under any circumstances. The events in the parking lot left me completely in the dark about who was shooting at whom, and frankly, I had no desire to find out. All I could be sure of was that I was being relentlessly pursued by three different factions, each with their own reasons. Everything was very clear. At that moment, I was faced with a number of options. One option was to take a bus to Carson City and pick up your money. But I quickly discarded this idea as it seemed too risky. Yes, risky is the most appropriate word to describe it. All I wanted was to get out of the clutches of an unfaithful wife. How could it happen that everything escalated so dramatically? Having decided to give the money some time to settle down, I had to find a safe haven. I had more than $4,000 left at my disposal, and I knew that it would last for a while. The question was spinning in my head, why my wife tried to take my life. Perhaps she didn't realize that the insurance money was no longer available. I always thought she was smarter, but I clearly underestimated her. Realizing my blunder, I made an impulsive decision to take a bus to San Francisco. But I soon discovered that you can't get far in this expensive city for a thousand dollars. Despite this, I managed to get a social security number and an identification card for this amount, which gave me the opportunity to find a job. I came across a room with a bathroom in the hallway and was able to get a job as a waiter in a modest restaurant. Gradually, I began to earn enough to feed myself and even gained recognition as an experienced waiter, and some customers specifically asked me to bring them my tables. But I forgot to make payments for my mobile phone, as a result of which its service was discontinued. Since I haven't used it since leaving Reno, it cost me a small amount to purchase a new prepaid phone with 50 minutes of conversation. Despite wanting to contact Dora, I had no idea where she was or how to contact her. I decided to call Jerry. Hi buddy, this is Robert, I just wanted to meet you. Robert, I'm glad to hear from you, Jerry exclaimed. It's still a bit chaotic, but not as bad as you can imagine. And where are you now? He asked. I'm not willing to reveal my location. It's none of your business, I replied curtly. The last time we talked, I was surrounded by unpleasant personalities, each of whom had their own selfish motives. Do I still have problems? Well, most of this nonsense has subsided, especially after Sandra's arrest, Jerry explained. But it looks like the IRS is still after me for some kind of payments related to my 401k assets. What do you mean Sandra was arrested? I thought you knew about it. Have you ever heard of Lester Laszlo? I had a brief meeting with him about three months ago. He tried to harm me, but our meeting was interrupted by a group of people chasing me. While they were hotly arguing about who would detain me, I managed to escape through the back exit. How did Laszlo fit into this situation? Sandra actually hired him to eliminate me. But Laszlo was seriously injured in a shootout in Reno and eventually confessed everything to the police. He accused Sandra of canceling a $10,000 contract and reported her to the police. Surprisingly, the police believed his story and brought charges against her. Unable to post bail, she is in jail pending trial. Jerry, I wish I could help her. But one day she tried to kill me. 
Although I think her parents should bail her out, I have no intention of helping. Let me explore the options, Rob. It seems that no one is particularly interested in your well-being right now. Should I start the divorce process again? I think we have enough grounds this time so it may be advisable to proceed with the divorce. Personally I no longer have a strong preference for one option or another. But I admit that it might simplify things. I have saved all the other necessary papers and believe that most of them can be used. By the way, I forgot to mention that all your children returned home when Sandra ran into trouble. They were worried at first but their interest faded as soon as the truth was revealed. They really want you to contact them and assure them of your well-being. I'll contact them as soon as I can. By the way, how did your money laundering scheme go? The situation is hopeless. I lost control and all means. I will try to solve this problem next week. Jerry, sometimes even the most thoughtful plans turn out to be inadequate. Okay, please stay in touch, my friend. By the way, Jerry, did Sandra ever reveal her motives for wanting me dead? As far as I know, no. I assumed it was because of the insurance not knowing that you cancelled it. I visited the children and they were fine. Knowing that their tuition had already been paid in advance brought them some relief. They were wondering what happened between you and Sandra but I couldn't bring myself to tell them about it. Some questions had to wait. I borrowed a car and drove to Carson City. Unfortunately the safety deposit box was empty. It would be tactful of her to leave at least a note. But I can't complain too much because I gave her the key and access to the cell. Did she escape to Guadalajara, or did she find a secluded place where I couldn't find her? There's only one way to find out. There are several small travel agencies in my San Francisco area, most of which specialize in group tours for like-minded people. I finally managed to find a last-minute cancellation for a tour to my favorite Mexican city, even though money was tight. It was a new experience for me, when I needed to scrape together enough funds for something. Fortunately, several of my colleagues from the restaurant were also going on this trip, which made me feel calmer. While most of them preferred to take side trips, I had other plans. But the first two days of the trip turned out to be very unsuccessful. The Libere Todd market turned out to be much larger than I expected, and it left me feeling disappointed. Looking back, I realized that I made the wrong choice. I couldn't help but wonder if Dora, to whom I had given the money, had decided to take the opportunity to go to a more exotic place, such as Bangkok or Tahiti. I knew she had more than enough money in her safe to live wherever she wanted. Not knowing what to do, I was torn between waiting for her to pass by and actively searching. In the end I decided to do both. Gradually the days became more and more monotonous. Just in time, Robert. Where have you been? Turning around, I saw Dora, confidently placing her hands on her hips. Wearing a wide-brimmed straw hat decorated with a bright red ribbon, she stood in front of me. My disappointment reached its peak. I wasn't sure if you were okay. Say something for God's sake. I was in agony, not knowing if you were even alive, she pleaded. Without saying a word, I closed the distance between us and pressed my lips to hers finally succumbing to the desire that I had been suppressing for so long. The reasons for my indecision eluded me, but at that moment I was grateful that I had decided to take this step. That explanation is not enough, she insisted. Deciding to adequately express my feelings, I bent down for a second kiss and at the same time wrapped her in a warm embrace, lifting her off the ground. Dora, I've missed you so much. I'm dying to know where you've been for the last month, but I can't wait any longer. Let's go home and have lunch. As we strolled through the market with our arms entwined, I was overcome by a feeling of joy and satisfaction that I had not felt for a very long time. Robert, please don't be mad at me, but I used some of your money. I put most of it in the bank, but I needed somewhere to live, and I let myself buy a house for both of us. I was hoping you wouldn't mind, considering you had a significant amount of money in the bank. This is an exquisite manor house located in a stunning city. I found myself in the company of an incredible woman. When a well-thought-out plan comes to life, it brings me joy. 
Sandra's parents managed to raise the necessary funds to ensure her release from prison and cover legal costs. It wasn't difficult for Jerry to get her signature on the divorce papers. Surprisingly, she received a sentence of five to eight years for trying to arrange for me, although I still do not understand her motives. Todd Mitchell provided Jerry with a statement, which, fortunately, Jerry never had to use. In addition, Jerry managed to find Ray, who managed to stay sober, but had difficulties in other areas of his life. When Jerry asked how to help him, Ray expressed a desire to become the owner of a hot dog cart. Fortunately, I was able to improve my situation by paying $2,400. In addition, I settled my problems with the tax service by paying $4,000. Laszlo ended up in prison in Nevada with Dora's husband and brothers, and we are not sure about the length of their stay in prison. When all these obstacles were left behind, I was finally able to return home. It is noteworthy that my previous job was still available, and I even got a promotion. The authorities no longer pursued me legally. Once Dora's Mexican divorce is finalized, we intend to tie the knot, and our children will join us during spring break to celebrate the wedding. Although the house in Guadalajara is undoubtedly amazing, we have no intention of living in it permanently. Dora wants to keep it exclusively as a place to relax. Emily is looking forward to my return to work, especially for a new position that promises us both a promotion. Dora, on the other hand, is ready to move anywhere, as long as we stay together. She expresses a desire to meet Sandra, and this prospect seems intriguing to me. Despite the fact that my plans do not match up with expectations, I have no reason to complain. I am happy again and it makes me very happy. But Sandra has a hard life ahead of her. It's time to pay her back for her actions. Ryan missed the last customer call of the day, wanting to get home early and work out before the honeymoon. When he opened the front door, he was shocked to see his stunning bride in an exquisite black cocktail dress, a delicate string of pearls, transparent black stockings and elegant high-heeled shoes. He couldn't help but think about how incredibly attractive she looked. But his delight quickly turned to confusion when he noticed the fear in her voice. It seemed that her plan to avoid confrontation was starting to crumble. At first, Ryan thought she'd forgotten about their planned dinner date. Hiding his surprise, he forced a smile, kissed the bride, and confidently declared, Give me ten minutes and I'll be clean-shaven and ready to go. Caroline's trembling voice sounded confused. Where to? Ryan's heart began to race, and he froze in place at her question. With a note of concern, he replied, of course with you. Anywhere you look so incredibly attractive. After a tense silence, the bride-to-be finally spoke with regret. Dear, I'm very sorry, but you misunderstood me. Oh my god, I was so afraid of this conversation that I planned to leave you a note explaining everything. Ryan was completely at a loss when he saw Caroline's overnight bag standing by the front door. Sensing his confusion, Caroline clarified the situation. I won't be home this weekend, she said, which made Ryan even more confused. What do you mean you won't be home? What is it? He asked, his confusion deepening. Caroline sighed, her concern obvious. I'm so overwhelmed with the wedding arrangements that I just have to leave, she explained. Ryan continued to insist, demanding clarification. And where are you going to escape to? What is it? He asked. To a hotel in the city center, not alone at all, she replied, keeping Ryan silent for more than a minute. In the end, he couldn't resist voicing his concerns. So, you're going to be with a friend? Ryan asked. Caroline's guilty expression confirmed his suspicions. It's not like that. He's just a friend, she defended herself. Ryan's voice grew louder, and he began to gesture wildly with his fists desperately trying to express his disappointment. Do you think I'm going to believe that you're going to share a hotel room with a man a week before our wedding and claim that he's just a friend? He exclaimed. Caroline looked contrite. It's not like that. He's a friend of mine that I've been talking to, she admitted. Ryan, filled with anger, demanded to know about the nature of their conversations. Talking about what? 
About our relationship? About us? He demanded. Ryan stood and waited patiently for her to raise her head. Tears streamed down her face, smearing the mascara adorning her cheeks. In a matter of moments, all the careful preparations of the last two hours turned into chaos. Taking a deep breath, he plucked up the courage and asked her one last time with a note of desperation in his voice, Who is this person responsible for this? I promise I won't hurt him. But if you do this I swear to reveal his identity and make sure that he never sees the warmth of the sun again. This is my solemn promise. Emotions overwhelmed Caroline, and she collapsed to the floor. She curled up in a ball, resembling a whining puppy who had just destroyed his master's cherished slippers. Ryan, overcome with disappointment, begged her to get up and answer. But the silence continued, and there was no answer. Unable to contain his anger any longer, Ryan tore the mirror off the wall in the foyer and threw it across the room. When it hit the wall of the dining room, the glass shattered, strewing the wooden floor with sharp fragments. The sound startled Caroline, and she hurriedly got to her feet. In a trembling voice, barely audible, she managed to explain, That's why I planned to turn off the phone and leave you a note explaining why I had to do this. Ryan's expression sent shivers down Caroline's spine. Realizing the gravity of the situation, she continued, her voice filled with fear. If you had returned home at the usual time, you would have found an empty house. In response, Ryan just nodded, trying to keep control of his emotions. Ryan angrily opened his briefcase and forcefully pulled out a notebook and pen. With a quick movement, he threw them onto the dining table and then aggressively pulled out a chair. It better be an unusual note, he hissed. Caroline reluctantly sat down and began to write, her hand trembling slightly. After a few minutes, she abruptly stopped writing and put down her pen. Ryan waited impatiently, hoping she would continue, but when she didn't show the slightest desire to do so, he snatched the notebook from her. To his amazement, she only managed to write one sentence. Next week, I'm starting a new chapter in my life. Ryan's shock was obvious as he struggled to find the words. There was emotion in his voice. Tell me the truth. Were you going to admit that you were leaving with another man? In desperation, he added, if I had more time, I would give you the opportunity to explain your feelings. His request went unanswered, and his frustration only deepened. You haven't answered my question, he pressed, his voice trembling. I would try to formulate it so that you would understand. What I'm doing is good for our marriage, to make it stronger. Caroline's explanation seemed absurd to Ryan, and he couldn't make sense of it. This is crazy! It doesn't make any sense! He exclaimed, his anger rising. How can an affair strengthen our marriage? Without giving her a chance to answer, he bitterly concluded, People get divorced when one of them cheats. If you don't tell me his name right now, the wedding is off, Caroline said, squeezing his wrists tightly. Ryan pulled away from her grip. Tell me his name, he demanded, but was met with silence. You have one last chance. Ryan warned, his voice full of disappointment. Tell me his name or leave my house and never come back. Caroline begged him, tears streaming down her face. Ryan, please don't say that. I love you more than anything in the world, but I have to do this. Ryan opened the front door, deciding to make one last statement. Tell me his name or get out of my house. In a moment of weakness, Caroline finally broke down. This is Scott. Scott Jenkins from work, she admitted, her voice trembling. He's our boss. Ryan flushed with anger. This bastard is older than your father, he shouted. Caroline's screams echoed through the house, her pain and regret spilling out like a tortured soul. Ryan's questions became more and more poignant. Have you slept with him yet? What is it? He asked, desperately demanding an answer. Have you slept with him yet? Caroline couldn't bring herself to speak. Her gaze was fixed on the floor. Ryan's voice was getting louder. His heart was breaking with every second. Have you slept with him yet? He repeated, his voice full of anguish. 
Caroline covered her face with her hands, unable to face the truth. Her silence spoke volumes and Ryan was devastated. I'm still waiting for an answer. Have you slept with him yet? She nodded in confirmation. That simple gesture hit Ryan harder than any baseball bat. His heart started pounding wildly and he thought he was having a heart attack. Dizziness seized him and he clutched at the table to keep from falling. Caroline stood there afraid to say a word. Ryan took several deep breaths before he could speak. If I remember correctly from the Christmas party, he's married. What does his wife think about him having an affair with a beautiful young blonde? She doesn't mind. She's menopausal, and she hasn't been able to have sex for almost a year. Did she tell you that? No, Mr. Jenkins. He mentioned that she was too embarrassed to discuss it. Why don't we call her and ask her? No. He said it would only humiliate her even more. Give me your phone. I don't have his home number, just his cell phone. It means that this vile man is hiding behind his wife's back. No, no. He appreciates her emotions and doesn't want to undermine her femininity. I can't understand your stupidity when you defend him. I can't take it anymore. Get out of here, you filthy wench. How dare you label me like that? How would you describe a woman who has an affair with a married man? He turned away from her. Before you leave, I have one more question. Why were you going to spend the weekend with another man? Finally, she answered. It's all because of you. You know that. I'm sorry, but I don't understand what you're talking about. When we decided to take our relationship seriously, you admitted that you had intimate relationships with three other girls before me. While I was only with you, I assured you at the time that it didn't bother me, but after we discussed it with Scott, it began to affect me emotionally. I began to feel the need to take revenge by cheating on you. Scott believes that in order for our marriage to be successful, we must enter it on equal terms. He advised me to do it now, because I used to say that I would never stay married to a man who was cheating on me. But wait, I said it was before I met you. Since our first date, I have remained absolutely faithful to you. Ryan continued to explain, expressing his disappointment. So, you're saying that you built our entire future on the advice of a manipulative older man who just wanted to be with a younger woman? No, it's not like that. I mean, yes, we discussed it, and he helped me realize how unfair the situation was for me, but he never tried to manipulate me. Didn't it occur to you that he had a purpose? No, it wasn't like that. He just wanted to help us. Let me explain. Although he didn't say much, he helped me sort out my thoughts. He helped me understand that I have the right to enter into relationships with multiple partners so that we can approach our marriage on an equal footing. This is absurd! Ryan cried out in frustration. Ryan, I really didn't enjoy being intimate with anyone else. But my love for you is so strong that I'm ready to devote myself to just one person. Caroline smiled naively, as if she had played a winning card. Ryan stared at her, disbelief and surprise in his eyes. The situation was so absurd that he couldn't help but laugh if it wasn't for the overwhelming confusion he was feeling. When Scott explained everything was quite logical, but now it seemed that everything had not gone according to plan. Everything was not as it should have been. She was right. They were supposed to be together forever, loyal and devoted to each other. There was anger on Ryan's face, as if he was on the verge of losing control. How did she think he should react when he found out she was having an affair with her boss? No, it wasn't like that. She distorted the truth. In that case, he asked, what do you think will happen when you get home after the weekend with that bastard? Did you expect me to humbly accept and express gratitude for the fact that the old man slept with my fiancé? No way. I always hoped that you would never know this truth. You are very dear to me, and I never wanted to hurt you. I wanted to keep it as my personal secret, forever hidden from prying eyes. You believed that by leaving for a week and not informing me of your whereabouts and cutting off all contacts, I would never find out about your infidelity. He looked at her with disdain, as if she had no mind. But she kept talking. Even if you knew the truth, I thought that your love for me would allow you to understand the justice of the situation. 
We would get married and live happily ever after. Justice. The word provoked anger. Do you really believe that I'm going to marry you after you've had an affair? Asked Ryan. He's just a man who used the services of a trusting woman. No, he is a compassionate man who sincerely wanted to save our marriage. She defended herself. How many times have you had an intimate relationship with him or with any other man? Ryan demanded. I swear there were no other men, she begged. Then tell me, how many times have you been with him? Caroline's voice was shaking with tears. Not so much, seven or eight times. You betrayed me with another man seven or eight times while we were engaged, and you have the nerve to downplay it? Her sobs echoed through the room as she continued. I did it out of desperation, for the sake of our future marriage. Do you remember our conversation when I confessed that I was not innocent? I never mentioned that I had intimate relationships with three girls before you. But I admitted that I was with someone three times, and that someone was Sally McDonough, my previous girlfriend, to whom I was devoted before I met you. We planned to run away after graduation. The situation came to an abrupt end when her mother unexpectedly came in to us and found us without clothes. The rest of the story is predictable. The next day they left the city, and all communication with her stopped. I met you next month. Since that day I have not entered into any intimate relationship with another woman. I have not even kissed anyone. Caroline felt awkward hearing this. So, according to my calculations, you are ahead by seven or eight positions and I remain only three. I suppose I need to enter into a physical relationship with four, five other women to even the score. What do you think? Is that fair? Yes, I have no idea what happened to Sally. Do you think your old lover will agree that I have the right to these four meetings? Let's look at five different women to achieve equality between us. What about your best friend Laura? You've always expressed concern about her in my environment. Maybe your sister? She is not married now and is not dating anyone. Wait, Ryan, please, I'm begging you. Give me at least one good reason against it. I'm ready to end the affair and cancel our weekend plans together. You have to understand. Yes, I made a mistake, but it was for the sake of our relationship. No, it was purely for your benefit. Please, Ryan, give me another opportunity, she begged desperately. It's too late. Eight classes are too late. I will never be able to trust you again. I really ask you to give me another opportunity, and I also solemnly promise never to repeat my mistakes. Ryan held up his hand, silencing her. The act you did was truly vicious and led to the breakup of our relationship. Now the possibility of a wedding is excluded. No way. Please refrain from saying these words. My love for you remains unshakable and I swear never to betray your trust again. What hurts me even more than your infidelity is your inability to trust me in moments of uncertainty. To me, the man to whom you confessed your love. I can't imagine what I would say or do in such a situation, but I can assure you that I would never encourage you to have an affair with a married man. Only someone who seeks to destroy a marriage could suggest such a thing. There was silence and Caroline felt death tearing her soul and dreams out of her chest. It became difficult to breathe, and a bitter taste of bile remained in my mouth. What do you think your mother will say when she finds out that we're not getting married because you were looking for other men besides just trying wedding cakes? Especially an older man. In response, Caroline shouted aloud, No! Rest assured, I will make sure that everyone knows about your actions. Our families and friends will be informed that our wedding will not take place because of your affair with a married man. Ryan forcefully grabbed her left hand, almost dislocating her finger when he took the wedding ring from his ex fiance No, this ring belongs to me. You gave it to me. She waved her hands, desperately trying to regain the symbol of their commitment. You betrayed us. You have betrayed everything that this ring stands for. He gripped it tightly in his fist. It's over. I can't marry you. I'm asking you to leave before I do something I'll regret later. Caroline was deeply struck by the sheer weight of these words. 
When she tried to answer, she found that she couldn't shape them with her trembling mouth. Instead, a faint sound escaped her lips, like the desperate sigh of a dying soul clinging to its last moments. Her wide-open eyes betrayed her inner turmoil, and her body was trembling uncontrollably. An eerie silence reigned in the once noisy room as everyone realized the gravity of the situation. Tears were streaming down Ryan's face, reminding him of the sadness he hadn't felt since his father died. Caroline frantically searched through her memories, desperately searching for the perfect words to save her crumbling marriage. Alas, her efforts were in vain, as no consolation came to her mind. It was at this moment that she finally realized the cruel truth. She had been deceived. The calm of the room was abruptly disturbed by a strong knock on the door. Caroline was brought out of her stupor and quickly regained her composure. Oh my God, that must be Scott, she muttered. I'll ask him to leave. Please, let's not escalate the situation. Ryan, feeling the obvious tension, clung to a baseball that was standing right at the entrance. I won't create any problems, he assured, his voice full of determination. Instead, I will end his life right here in the lobby, and you will be a witness. Stunned, Caroline jumped to her feet, desperately trying to intervene. He's not worth sacrificing freedom for, she pleaded. I'm begging you to change your mind. Ignoring her pleas, he sidestepped her, saying, I don't have anything meaningful to live for anymore. But revenge in the form of his death would put us on an equal footing, given the pain he caused me, he reflected. Meanwhile, she was trying to contact him and dial his mobile phone number to warn him. Unfortunately, her call was redirected to voicemail. Ryan gripped the bat tightly in one hand, carefully opening the door, fully prepared to neutralize the elderly man. To his surprise, two police officers were standing in front of him. He instantly released his grip, causing the bat to hit the ceramic tile floor, making a sharp crack. The police ignored his presence and turned to Caroline Bradley. I'm sorry, ma'am. Are you Caroline Bradley? One of the policemen asked. In an effort to understand the situation, she replied, And what exactly is the problem, officer? The policeman went inside, closing the door behind him. Do you know Mrs. Loretta Jenkins? No, but I work for her husband, Scott. Interestingly, the officers seemed to exchange glances and secretly amused themselves. Is everything okay? Did something happen to Loretta? No, madam, but about an hour ago, Mrs. Jenkins tragically took her husband's life within the walls of their living room. Caroline lost consciousness and plummeted to the floor. Ryan brought an overly large pot filled with water from the kitchen. Without thinking, he splashed water on her face. As a result, her once immaculately styled hair looked like the hair of a soaked rodent. It took several minutes before she found her voice. In a soft, trembling tone, she whispered, Oh my God, Scotty is dead. And her words were punctuated by sobs. Yes, ma'am, the detective replied. It was one of the most cold-blooded acts we've ever witnessed. There was silence in the room. Only Ryan laughed which caused the police to look at him in disbelief. It looks like Mrs. Jenkins didn't give her husband permission to spend the weekend with you, one of the officers remarked. We need you to come to the station, ma'am. A neighbor overheard Mrs. Jenkins threatening to kill you for ruining her marriage. We have several patrol cars that monitor the surroundings, but we believe that you will be safer in the city center. Caroline's face was pale and empty, almost catatonic. Never come back, you liar! Her ex-fiancé's voice trailed off as his ex-partner let out a terrifying scream. The police had to help Caroline as they led her to their car. Ryan stared at the receding blue lights, his mind preoccupied with the bewildered wreckage of his once promising life. In search of solace, he resorted to the hypnotic effect of three consecutive glasses of Jack Daniels. With each sip, his inhibitions weakened, and he gained the ability to formulate his thoughts. Impulsively, he took possession of Caroline's laptop and set about creating an email that would reach every person she was connected to, be it family, friends, colleagues, or even devout members of the choir at their local church. Determined, 
Ryan captioned his creation, why I can no longer commit to marrying Caroline Bradley, revealing the harsh truth. Turn on the news today and you will see in the headline a story about a middle-aged woman who tragically took her husband's life because of his affair with a younger person. Unfortunately, we are talking about my ex fiance Caroline, who, as it turned out, adhered to high moral standards, often condemning others for promiscuity. It is shocking that she was in a relationship with a man much older than herself and caused the untimely death of a 60-year-old man. This case has once again confirmed my decision to avoid marriage, as I am grateful that I was able to avoid a future with such an unfaithful personality. Once you cheat, you always cheat. By the way, Caroline is hiding in the police because her lover's widow is looking for her with a thirst for revenge. I secretly wish her harm. Soon after clicking the send button, numerous replies were showered on him within a few minutes. Following this, his phone rang continuously. The first call came from a local newspaper asking for an interview. In response, he sent the reporter several photos of Caroline in a revealing bikini. Then he talked about her betrayal. In addition, he agreed to be interviewed live on a local radio station. Ryan spent the next few hours talking to reporters and diligently answering emails. Most of these conversations were filled with support, especially from Caroline's friends and family. But when fatigue set in from the constant stories about what happened, Ryan decided to take a break. Using sturdy garbage bags, he carefully collected all of Caroline's belongings and put them away. As a result, four bags were filled to capacity, and he took them outside, placing them by the trash cans in front of the garage. Considering that Ryan lived in a quiet residential suburb where no crime had occurred in the past five years, the local newspaper drew attention to this rare incident and put it as a headline the next morning. TV channels suddenly invaded the quiet area. On the evening newscasts, they all made sure to show a photo of the fugitive suspect, as well as Ryan's ex fiance in a bikini and the victim. When darkness enveloped the neighborhood, Ryan decided to empty a bottle of bourbon. The next morning, a television crew arrived just in time to film the locksmith replacing the locks. To complete the process, no trespassing signs were placed all over the house. Just two hours later, law enforcement agencies found Loretta Jenkins sleeping peacefully in her car, a few blocks from Caroline's apartment. She was easily detained. Ryan, feeling the effects of a hangover, was startled by an insistent knock on his front door. Annoyed, he shouted for him to leave. In response, the voice said that it was the police. Reluctantly, he opened the door. The officer informed him that his intended bride wished to return home to explain her actions. Ryan immediately denied that he had a fiancé and clarified that this was not her house. He gestured towards the police car, emphasizing that this was his home and would never be hers. Scared of his possible actions, he went to the trash bags and asked to pick her up, as he might regret his behavior later. I have all her things. Kindly inform her that I will never forgive her and will not talk to her anymore. No way. As she sat in the police car, the sounds of her screams reached his ears. Ryan, I love you. He slammed the door shut and turned up the volume on the TV. He chose a movie channel and leaned back in his seat to enjoy a classic black and white western. No one has ever admitted to sending incriminating photos to his wife revealing Jenkins's infidelity. But everyone agreed that Scotty's secretary, when she came to the office on Monday morning, put on an obviously smug expression on her face. Caroline was ostracized in society. Her reputation was tarnished beyond recognition. She had barely taken a step into her office when she was unceremoniously fired from her job. Despite the best efforts of expensive lawyers hired by the wife of the late owner, who could not prove her temporary insanity, the business was eventually sold to a Chinese investor. The new owner wasted no time in laying off all staff and moving production to a remote island. Subjected to universal condemnation from family and friends, Caroline was declared an adulteress. The day after testifying in court, she made the decision to leave her past in the past. 
She packed all her things in the car and went on a trip to start her life with a clean slate. Driving out of town, she couldn't resist driving past Ryan's house to take one last look at him. The for sale sticker now adorned the for sale sign, signifying the end of an era. Trying to move on, she started to drive away, but her vision was blurred by tears. Overwhelmed with emotion, she stopped the car, closed her eyes, and desperately tried to remember the comforting embrace of his arms. Time brought profound changes. And six years later, Ryan unexpectedly returned to his hometown. But this return was marked by a grim event. The funeral of a childhood friend who bravely gave his life in Iraq and was hailed as a hero. The Alumni Association spread the message among his graduating class, expecting a lot of people to come to the meeting. It had been a long time since he had last visited the city. He remembered the night when his wife Brooklyn, whom he affectionately called Brooke, was eight months pregnant. As they strolled through the town square, she held his hand tightly, aware of the painful memories associated with each step. But their energetic three-year-old son Ryan Jr. could not contain his excitement and rushed forward, impatiently waiting for his slow-moving parents to catch up with him. When his parents stopped to admire the window of an antique store, Ryan Jr. impulsively rushed away, ignoring the surrounding environment and collided with a woman coming out of another store. She took several steps back from the impact, causing her bag to slip out of her hands and its contents scattered on the sidewalk. Among the fallen items was a condolence card that caught Brooke's attention. In a stern tone, she called out, Ryan Robert Erickson, stop moving immediately. Hearing his full name, the woman involuntarily shuddered. Sensing the gravity of the situation, Ryan's mother quickly turned to the woman and sincerely apologized, explaining, I'm sorry, we sat in the car for six hours and he just has an overabundance of energy. Ryan Jr. approached the woman, taking the initiative to apologize for accidentally bumping into her. I'm sorry that I bumped into you ma'am and made you cry. Are you all right? He asked sincerely. Brooke, who was watching the exchange, praised Ryan Jr. for his excellent manners. Your son is really well-mannered, a real gentleman. You should be proud of him. When Ryan Sr. bent down to pick up the fallen bag, he suddenly recognized the woman. Their eyes met, and there was a tense look between them as Ryan Jr. helped assemble the ironing pen. Staying true to his promise, Ryan Sr. calmly handed the bag back to the woman. At that moment, Brooke noticed that tears glistened in her husband's eyes. Instantly recognizing the woman, she quickly stood up in a formidable shield, like a lioness protecting her defenseless cubs. With a furious look, she defiantly met the unwelcome presence, warning her to stay away from her cherished family. Caroline silently retreated, and Brooks uttered the words, Never. A whore is forever. We all gathered at Istanbul Airport, ready to return to Chicago. The flight duration was a grueling 11 hours, so before landing we made sure that everyone was in place. But, to our disappointment, the flight was unexpectedly delayed for six hours. With enough time left, we decided to go to the waiting room, but found it completely empty. It was very surprising to be the only ones there. When we all got together, the atmosphere quickly became cheerful. Conversations filled the air, everyone shared their impressions and pleasant memories of their stay in Turkey, especially about the delicious food we enjoyed. Needing a break, I went outside, but few people knew that what awaited me upon my return would cause a whole whirlwind of emotions. As I approached my wife, my heart began to beat faster due to an unfamiliar sensation. The closer I got, the faster my heart was pounding as if trying to escape from my chest. At that moment, I was mentally transported back in time almost two decades ago. I vividly remember standing hand in hand with her in church, ready to start a new chapter in our life together. The words I agree echoed in my mind as I recalled our tender kiss. We were building a life together, and the memories came flooding back with such force that for a moment they transported me from the present moment to the past. 
I went up to my wife and quietly informed her that I needed to get some fresh air before going outside. Ignoring the woman who was currently talking to her, I left the room. As I was leaving, the memories came flooding back to me, overwhelming me like an unstoppable flood. Right here, in the back of my mind, she lived. The happiness we shared was palpable, and I closed my eyes, transported to Columbus, Georgia on the banks of the serene Chattahoochee River. Our frequent visits to this place filled all my thoughts. Her name, Maria, echoed in my mind, because she was the very essence of my existence. From the moment I saw her in college, I knew she had to be mine. We entered into a marriage alliance and started a life together. The first days of our marriage were filled with joy and contentment. I made a career as a journalist, and Maria succeeded as a financial expert. My profession required a lot of travel, and I had to go to a variety of places, covering a variety of events, from war zones to regions gripped by famine. But I've never let distance sever our bond. The glow in her eyes brightened up my every day. Whenever I returned home, we enjoyed the moments of intimacy and tasted the delicious dishes that she expertly prepared. Will you love me like this forever? Maria asked one day, penetrating deep into my soul with her gaze. I caressed her bare back, whispering the words, forever and ever. The first two years of our relationship flew by unnoticed, and we were sure that our paradise would remain trouble-free. Striving for a successful career and financial stability, we made a conscious decision to postpone starting a family. Unfortunately, the only problem we faced was the lack of quality time spent together. The profession of both required frequent business trips, which left an imprint on our relationship. But the main source of our disagreement was my mother. She lived alone and longed for my presence, much to my wife's displeasure. I've never wondered about the reasons. My mother was a caring and gentle person. I tried to keep them away from each other and keep a balance between them. In January, my mother got sick. I informed my wife that I would be visiting her to provide care. She expressed displeasure, considering that I had just returned home after serving in Iraq. A dispute arose because she insisted on hiring help for my mother instead of my personal involvement. I explained to her that my mother was old and this might be my last chance to see her alive. Maria was unhappy, but I decided not to dwell on her dissatisfaction. Three days later, my mother passed away in my arms. I was shocked. After her funeral, I returned home and Maria started complaining about my mother again. I was stunned and tried to understand her intentions. She caused us a lot of suffering. It would have been better if she had been admitted to the hospital from the very beginning. I fell silent, trying to figure out why Maria would belittle a man who was no longer able to answer. In response, I reminded her that she had died and would not return. So be quiet. Maria got angry and all that week we refrained from communicating with each other. We had dinner together. At night we made wild love. The very next week I went to Afghanistan passing along the historical Silk Road. At this time Maria achieved a career promotion and increased her salary. Two weeks later I returned. I arrived home and as always, Maria greeted me with a big hug and a big kiss. During dinner I noticed that she was a little worried. We need to change something in our lives. What do you want to change? Your prolonged absence from home is not good for me. There are days when I crave your touch. But I come home to an empty bed. I have no desire to deceive you. Therefore I beg you to find a job that will allow you to stay close to me, or help me find a job that will allow us to travel together. Although I was puzzled at first, I appreciated her honesty and frankness. I assured her that I would look for an alternative job. That was the end of our conversation, and the next morning, I submitted my resignation and started looking for a job closer to home. In the end, I got a job at a local TV channel. Although the salary at the new job was lower than at the previous one, I had the opportunity to be near Maria. When I shared this news with her, she reacted with anger. I tried to explain that this is an inevitable compromise for stationary work. 
Sometimes, regardless of a woman's level of education or intelligence, she prefers to ignore some facts and insist that everything go on as usual. It would be unrealistic to expect both proximity and a salary increase from stationary work, unless the person changes his profession. She was upset that I was helping less with the housework now, which was affecting her lifestyle. Despite this, we continued to live together. But over the next three months, the situation took a turn for the worse. Our communication has decreased, and nighttime intimacy has become scarce. Her once loving behavior has turned into constant nagging and criticism. She seemed to find flaws in everything, and I went to bed angry every day. The situation worsened to such an extent that one night she even asked me to stop breathing because my breathing was preventing her from sleeping. A few days later I couldn't find my phone. In an attempt to find him, I decided to use my wife's phone to call my own number. To my surprise, her phone was locked, which was unusual. I've never had a lock on my phone, and as far as I remember, she never had one either. This discovery made me wonder if she was hiding something. It happened on Thursday evening, when she was returning home after a late-night party with colleagues. I heard the doorbell ring, and when I opened it, I found her standing in a disheveled black dress, with disheveled hair and no lipstick. Worried, I asked what was wrong and hugged her to me. She just replied, maybe I danced too much. I was exhausted as I led her to the bedroom. She started to change into her usual nightgown, but something caught my attention. She wasn't wearing any panties, and I noticed a bruise on her left thigh. It was unusual because she never went outside without underwear. Did she accidentally lose them, or did she deliberately decide to go without underwear? This uncertainty haunted me that night. As a journalist, I felt obligated to get to the truth, even though I had a network of contacts who could help me. But I trusted my instincts and thought I could handle it alone. Three weeks later I found myself near a motel on Victory Drive. It was 2.30 p.m., and I tracked Maria's car to this particular motel. Determined, I went to room 12 and unlocked the door. My heart sank when I saw what was going on inside. There, in the next room, my beloved wife Maria was on all fours. She was engaged in an intimate act with her blonde lover, Steve Bowman. It was a harsh reality considering that Steve had always had feelings for Maria, even taking her on dates before we started dating. Despite the pain, I found solace in Maria's obvious pleasure as she screamed in delight. My heart was throbbing with pain. Three weeks of relentless investigation and pursuit of Maria have passed. The results were terrifying. The results that I didn't want to reveal. At that moment, I wanted to burst through the door and do something incredibly stupid. But I made a promise to the motel manager to refrain from violence. He repaid me for an old favor and set one condition, no punishment and damage to property. Reluctantly, I agreed, and he personally helped me place the recording devices in the room. Still, outside the motel, the possibility of conflict persisted. I forced a smile and left the motel, heading for my car. I parked right behind the only Mustang in the parking lot, which turned out to be Steve's. Taking out my trusty ice axe, I carefully punctured all four of its tires. Then I waited patiently. An hour later they got out of the car. Steve hugged Maria to him, putting his hand on her bare waist. I captured it all on camera. Carefully removing the camera, I got out of the car and walked up to them, standing directly in front of them. Maria was silent. Maria looked scared, her eyes widened as if she had seen a ghost. Steve grinned ominously, a clear symbol that he had committed betrayal by stalking someone else's wife. His hand was still on her waist, and Maria was weakly trying to remove it. Hi, Don. She forced a smile, trying to act casual. What are you doing here? I stared back at her, and a heavy silence fell between us. She made another futile attempt to explain, insisting... I can explain. It's not what you think. But I didn't have any thoughts, just observations. My gaze settled on Steve's arm around her waist, a chilling reminder of how he stole my wife. A smile flashed across my face, though not appreciative. No, that's not the point, 
I objected, not wanting to believe her weak excuses. We just had a meeting here, Maria hastily interjected, her voice strained. The word assembly hung in the air, endowed with a hidden meaning that sent a shiver down my spine. On all fours. It was the same phrase she had uttered just a few minutes ago, revealing the truth about their rendezvous. My response was cold and calculated. I informed her that their actions had been captured on video and that it would be sent to her office, to our friends and even to Linda and her father. Steve's cry of protest filled the space. Don't involve Linda in this, he pleaded, desperately trying to protect her from the consequences. Maria also added her voice, insisting that Linda was not involved in their affair. Her husband is sleeping with my wife, I said, dealing the final blow to the collapsed facade of their illicit relationship. Yes, we have a significant amount of unfinished business, I said with a smile. Linda has already witnessed your actions and is looking forward to video evidence to file for divorce. So I advise you to prepare to say goodbye to your beloved Mustang, as it will be sold to cover the settlement costs. His anger flared up and he rushed towards me. A gross mistake. The years I spent in Iraq and Afghanistan hardened me. I was surrounded by warriors and people trained to kill. Did they teach me a few tricks? With lightning speed, I deflected his right hook, quickly leaned forward and landed a powerful left hook to the chin. He collapsed to the ground like a sack of potatoes. Although he managed to get up, he stumbled towards me, but received a crushing uppercut to the jaw. He couldn't get up, and remained lying on the floor in a knockout. Maria stood in horror. I looked at her, ordering her to get into the truck. Without hesitation, she obeyed, and we took off. Our destination wasn't home. We went straight to my lawyer's office. Maria tried to ask a question, but I just raised my hand, signaling her to stop. We entered the office and were instructed to move to a spacious conference room. Once inside, we took seats on opposite sides of the table. The silence that followed was suffocating. Soon, Ron Freeman, my lawyer, came into the room and handed Maria an envelope. You have received a summons, he announced. Now let me explain the conditions. We officially filed for divorce based on irreconcilable differences. Neither of you have joint ownership, so no further discussion of this issue is required. As for his mother's house, the legal transfer to his name has not yet been completed. Therefore, you will not have any rights to it. He will provide you with half of the funds from your joint account. Currently, exactly half of the amount that was there in the morning is in the account, and you can withdraw it. Since your income is higher than his, there will be no alimony. It's all on my part. With that, Ron left the room. Maria clutched the envelope in her hands and looked at me. Finally, I spoke, warning. If you decide to challenge this decision, I will change the reason for the divorce to adultery and make sure that everyone who knows your name finds out about your wrong actions. I will make sure that all the records I have are posted on all social networks, I will personally deliver this evidence to your workplace to ensure that your dishonest behavior leads to your dismissal and the absence of any positive recommendations regarding future employment. Even if you try to escape to another city, I will relentlessly pursue you, ensuring that the rest of your life will be spent under the threat of tarnished reputation. I hope my intentions are clear. She nodded understandingly as I got up from my seat and left the room. But when she got up, she felt that she needed to speak. Don't you want to know why I did it? What is it? She asked. You wanted to lead a lifestyle that I just couldn't provide. You craved the thrill of soaring skyward, but at the same time dreamed of having someone waiting for you at home upon your return. You were striving for happiness, but you didn't want to pay the price for it. Fast cars, luxury hotels, and fine dining were your desires, and your blonde lover satisfied those needs in a way I couldn't. But I want to tell you that he was just paying for his temporary entertainment. He was already married and was looking for a cheap source of entertainment. How long could this have been going on? Maybe a few months. And then what? Would you continue your search looking for another lover? And then another one? Your happiness, my dear, is just a passing state of mind. You have a choice. 
to find happiness in simplicity or drown in sadness amid abundance. Today, as you stand here clutching an envelope and nothing else, I wish you a pleasant day, Maria. With that, I left. A few months passed and I met her again in court. We didn't exchange a single word, and I never once looked into her eyes. All I've seen are court orders. Our divorce was finalized without any objections from Steve. Even if he decided to challenge the decision, he would inevitably lose. The cameras in the parking lot captured his aggression, leaving him no chance to stand on his feet. I made sure to send Linda the videos and all the evidence of Steve's infidelity. She wasted no time, quickly kicked him out of the house and filed for divorce. There were rumors that Linda's brothers got into a fight with him, as a result of which he was treated for fractures for several days. As a result, he not only got divorced, but also lost his job. Linda's father, a well-connected man, wanted to punish Maria as well, but Linda intervened and prevented it. To pay compensation, Steve had to sell his cherished Mustang. I didn't divulge this information to anyone, but it's worth noting that Linda's father wanted retribution. In the end, I quit my job and found another position in another city. Life went on, and today, I am here. I found myself at Istanbul Airport, a well-known journalist of a prestigious magazine with enormous wealth. My wife, a devoted and reliable partner, accompanied me along with our wonderful daughter. When I went out into the waiting room, I noticed that my wife was engaged in a long conversation with Maria. Time seemed to be slipping away, and I decided to keep my distance, watching my wife's frequent furtive glances in my direction. I was filled with anxiety as I reflected on the intentions that had originated in Maria's head and did not know how she could interpret my past. A few hours later, wanting to calm down, I turned to the airport staff, who confirmed the scheduled departure time. After enduring a few difficult minutes, we made our way into the boarding queue, and finally I found myself next to my wife on the flight. Looking at her I noticed an unfamiliar smile on her face. Curious, I asked what she was talking about with the woman sitting next to her. Oh, this woman, I asked, referring to my ex-wife Maria. What were you discussing? To my surprise, my wife replied, I was expressing my gratitude. I frowned in disbelief and asked, Gratitude? For what? She returned my confusion with a gentle smile and replied, If she hadn't made those mistakes, I wouldn't have found my way to you. Intrigued, I continued, Did she mention me? My wife shook her head, dismissing the thought. No, she never talked about you. After carefully studying the court orders and reviewing the materials of your investigation, I found that they are in the attic. Curious, I asked about the topic of their conversation. To my surprise, she replied dispassionately, stating that she was just listening to her lamentations about missing her ex-husband and expressed a desire to trade everything for a life similar to my wife's. A faint smile graced my face and I closed my eyes leaning back in my chair, 